All right, everyone. Gonna start our second webinar for today. Hopefully uh, everyone can see my screen. So I'll be going over a, an introduction to C-sharp coding with Speckle. Uh, this is for beginner developers. And uh, I am currently a software engineer uh, working a lot with our C-sharp uh, based .NET connectors. So before we get started, uh, there are a few prerequisites. It'd be great if you could install Visual Studio uh, there's like install GitHub desktop uh, and clone our Speckle Sharp repo. I'll show you how to do that in the uh, live coding section of this webinar. Uh, also, for testing, it would be great if you had Rhino 6 or 7 installed. It's not necessary, but uh, recommended. So, this webinar will cover a few topics. We'll start with going over how Speckle approaches interoperability. Uh, we'll then talk about some core concepts in object-oriented programming, and then cover the Speckle base object in C Sharp specifically. And then finally end with an exercise. Uh, we're going to hack our Speckle Rhino connector and uh, do a simple test of creating your own Speckle object. So the goals for this webinar are to understand the role of uh, objects in the Speckleverse, to learn some strategies for designing your own objects, and to become familiar with the SpeckleSharp repo. It can be intimidating uh, getting started with an open source project, and uh, here to show you that it's not so uh, difficult. So let's start with the interoperability problem. And this is kind of a core problem that Speckle as a platform is trying to address within the AEC industry. And basically, we're trying to figure out how to get stuff between your desktop applications and Speckle and back again. So generally, we have a CAD program object. These are geometry objects or other objects in whatever desktop application you're using. And those objects can be retrieved via code through your software API. And what we're focusing on is designing speckle objects that are converted from your software API objects, and then finally uh, sending and storing our speckle objects in our server. So whenever you send an object from a connector, for instance, from Rhino to Revit, you're going through this process uh, between a CAD program object converting to a speckle object, saving it in our server, and then retrieving it from a server and converting it back to whatever other program you want to recreate your object in. So the first leg of this uh, process is kind of outside our control. This is defined by your third party software, and sometimes it can present limitations to uh, what uh, objects in your software you have access to and the degree to which you have access to them. S however, we're going to focus on this leg, which is uh, translating or converting between your software API objects and speckle objects. So basically, your software objects are defined with uh, what we're calling a few properties. In this example, uh, for instance, we have a basic box with a center point, volume, a plane, and some dimension in the X, Y, Z axis. Uh, our speckle objects, however, are slight abstractions of your software API objects. We're trying to reduce our object properties as much as possible. Uh, this is actually where the interoperability comes into play, and uh, you'll get to see firsthand sometimes how tricky it is to convert back and forth between your API objects and our speckle objects. So basically what differentiates our approach, uh, it can be defined as a minimalist versus a maximalist. 
uh, philosophy. So if you look at uh, quite a few different software APIs and look at how they define, for instance, a box object internally, uh, different APIs will have different means of uh, defining that defining the object with a bunch of different properties as well. If you take the full set of um, unique properties across all of the softwares we want to connect to, you get a quite a long list of properties. Uh, softwares or file formats, for instance, like IFC, take a maximalist approach where you simply consolidate all of these different properties. And when you're converting back and forth between your software object and uh, your own object, you basically have to set every single property every time, which is which can be quite uh, frustrating to do or time intensive. Um, what we're taking is a minimalist approach to interoperability, which is trying to reduce our base object properties as much as possible to encapsulate all of the potential variations you might see in the softwares we want to connect to. The way that we do this is by uh, using a dynamic object, which means that you can attach additional properties as needed. And this uh, really is on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, this approach basically allows for both speed and flexibility. Uh, for how you are defining your objects. So let's look at some core concepts for object-oriented programming. Uh, let's define it first. Object-oriented programming is programming that is based on objects and their data rather than actions and logic. There are four uh, main principles to object-oriented programming. They are abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. So with abstraction, uh, you are essentially creating blueprints, what we're going to call uh, classes. And they are simplified representations of objects and will model how they interact with each other. Uh, encapsulation uh, basically means that you're, in hi you're hiding how these classes or objects work on the inside. And you're only exposing specific properties and functions that can be accessed by your developer. Uh, inheritance means that you can create new abstractions that adopt the properties and methods of existing abstractions. And polymorphism means basically you can uh, implement a, bit, a bunch of different types of inheritances. And uh, they can be implemented in different ways across multiple abstractions. So the C-sharp class is essentially a data structure that is used to create objects. Uh, you can think of it as a blueprint or a schema. Uh, and the class will contain state information uh, that we call properties and actions that we call uh, methods. So you can create a class with a class declaration. If you look at the code, this is an example point class that is defined with a few basic properties. You have your x, y, and z coordinates. Uh, they are by default set to 0 in this class um, uh, definition. And the next line you see is an empty class constructor. This is how you create instances of your class, uh, essentially your object. And this constructor can also take what we're calling um, arguments. So you can pass arguments like your x, y, and z coordinates. And these properties will be set internally when you create an instance of your point class through this constructor. And then finally, you can uh, add methods to your class. These are actions. So here you have an example move method that takes an x, y, and z value and adds that to the stored x, y, and z coordinate properties, essentially moving your point by uh, your input arguments. So as mentioned, an object is an instance of a class. So to create an instance of a class, uh, if 
we look at the point class that we defined earlier, you can create an instance by calling the constructor. So the first line, you can see you're using the empty constructor. And uh, setting the, uh, if you want to retrieve um, uh, the class property, you can do so with that dot notation. So my point dot x will return the x coordinate value of your created point. Uh, you can also create an instance of your point with our arguments. So here we're creating a new point with the coordinates uh, 1, 3, and 5 for your x, y, and z values. And now if you try to retrieve the x value of your point, uh, it will return 1 instead of 0, which was our default. And then finally, you can use the dot notation to call a method on your class that is defined on your class. And here we're moving our points uh, an increment of 1 in your x, y, and z directions. And now if you retrieve your x coordinate again, it will return a value of 1 plus 1 uh, equals 2. Uh, the next concept is uh, type. This is the most abstract interface. Often you'll hear type and class used somewhat interchangeably in C Sharp. Uh, in C Sharp, there are built-in types called primitives, as well as custom types like the one that we just saw with our point class. So here we have our point class uh, simplified definition of the class. We're creating an instance of our point class. And when you use the getType method on your uh, MyPoint object, you, it'll return a type of point. If you try to uh, get the type of the x-coordinate property in your MyPoint object, it'll return a double because we are setting that type above in our class property. And finally, a class can be inherited by a new class that has additional attributes on top of the original ones that were defined. So here we are creating a new class called named point that inherits from our point class uh, using a colon. And what we're doing is in addition to the x, y, and z coordinate properties that we uh, defined in our point class, we are also defining a name property, uh, which is a string or uh, essentially a text value. So now if you create a new instance of your named point class, you can use the same constructor, which will set the x, y, and z inherited properties. And in addition to that, you can now also set your name property. And uh, this example just calls the point Amy. And then if you check your properties, uh, you'll see that it returns one when you uh, uh, look at the x property, when you try to retrieve the x property, since we declared our named point with the coordinates of one, three, and five. And then when you retrieve the type of your named point, it will show the inheritance structure. So now that we've reviewed our basic concepts of classes in object-oriented programming, we'll take a closer look at the speckled base object in C Sharp. The base object is basically the building block of speckle. Uh, all of our speckle objects will inherit from our base class. So a few general concepts, these are a little bit more advanced. The speckle base class uh, is of a dynamic type. This means that you can have strongly typed properties, uh, but then you can also attach flexible properties as needed. So as we saw in our point example before, a strongly typed property is something like, um, we'll go into what a double is later, but something like doubles, strings, booleans, uh, like decimal numbers, for instance, are all um, built-in types. Uh, but on, in addition to that, you can attach flexible properties as well. So what this looks like is, uh, say we have an instance of our base class called myBase. Uh, 
you can attach a number property to your my base object. Uh, here we're creating a property called number property and setting the value to uh, 10. And you can also attach other types of properties since it's a dynamic class. You can attach a property called string property with a string value or text value. And now when you try to retrieve the, the property that you just set, uh, you can do that with your brackets uh, with the name of the property. And you set the uh, type of that property value um, as what you defined it as. So the, ba the speckle base class is also serializable. Uh, this means that the object can be converted into a stream of bytes, which is encoded by a unique hash string. And finally, you can detach your properties from the base class. This means that the property stores a reference to uh, the value of the property. For example, it could be another base object instead of the object itself. So if we look at an example of what detaching means, if you create three instances of the base class, uh, a my base, a my second base, and a child base object, you can attach your child base object as a property to both of your first base objects. And then when these objects are sent to a speckle server, uh, essentially, since you're detaching that property, only one copy of the child-based object will be serialized and sent. And this is what helps boost performance in, in our Speckle platform. Uh, so all, as mentioned before, all Speckle object classes inherit from the base class. The base class will always contain a unique identifier. This is the serialized hash of the object um, and all the object's properties. Uh, a speckle type, which describes its inheritance structure. A children count, which keeps track of uh, the total number of your attached objects. And an optional application ID. So if you send, if you create a base class object from, for instance, a Rhino connector, it can help to include the application ID of the Rhino object it's converted from uh, for uh, conversion purposes. And finally, uh, this objects kit is part of our C Sharp SDK. It's essentially a compilation of what we find to be the most useful um, base objects uh, defined in a few different categories. We have intervals as prim primitives so far. Um, we have our geometry uh, namespace, which includes all of your um, basic geometry types. We have our built elements, which are more advanced uh, versions of our geometry objects. And these built elements are generic elements like walls, beams, columns, etc. cetera, um, that can then have inherited types that are application specific. So we have a Revit um, kit, uh, version of our built elements, uh, most of our built elements as well. Um, we have a very new structural kit. And uh, finally, we also support some objects such as blocks, render materials, hatches, and text. And we are constantly expanding our, our objects kit um, that comes packaged with our C Sharp SDK. So finally, uh, putting everything together, we're going to do a live coding session for hacking uh, the Rhino connector. And um, we're going to look at creating a really simple uh, speckle object that inherits from one of the Rhino, the, the speckle objects that are already defined, and um, look at uh, why you'd want to do that. All right. Swap screens. Oh, and there it is. <laughs> 
All right, so if you have the prerequisites installed, um, what I'm going to do really quickly is show you GitHub Desktop already um, added the Speckle Sharp repository to to GitHub Desktop, and we're going to move. Ooh, that's the wrong Speckle Sharp. There it is. So we're going to look at the main branch here. Um, we won't really get into um, how to manage your uh, code versioning, but if you've cloned the Speckle Sharp repo locally through uh, the GitHub desktop, uh, you'll be able to uh, see all of the bran branches that are currently um, being developed. These are just versions of what is the main branch. And so we're going to create a new branch right now just for this webinar to store all of the changes that we're going to be making to this code repository. And you can do that quite easily through the interface. I'm just going to call this branch Claire slash webinar. And this branch will be based off of the main branch. So now we can make changes um, to our code without worrying about it affecting the main branch. I'm going to publish this branch. And then you have an option of opening this branch in locally. So once you clone it, you'll have a local copy of the repository. And here you can look at our Speckle Sharp repo. It contains uh, all of our C Sharp connectors, as well as uh, some projects that are part of our SDK um, and will be built as libraries to, that you can use as references um, inside these connectors. So for today, we're just going to look at the uh, Rhino connector, and we can open up the solution directly. Do I have an instance of that? Yes, I do. So just to familiarize you really quickly with uh, what our repo looks like, it's a, it can be a little bit overwhelming just because um, we've gone with a mono repo convention, which means we store everything in the same in the same solution. Um, but if you open up the solution for the connectors individually, they are all more or less structured in the same way. Uh, we'll have the connector project, which is the, um, what you see uh, when you open up uh, Speckle inside your software application. And these, uh, the, the code for the Rhino connector, for instance, um, will be in a shared project. And this shared project is uh, referenced in your version project. So if you want to support your application in different versions of your software, uh, this is actually a fairly clean way of partitioning your solution. And within the, your shared connector project, um, this essentially is what handles, uh, like once you create your Speckle objects, this is what allows you to serialize it and send it to uh, the Speckle server. And we won't really be focusing too much on this solution. We're going to be looking mostly within our object conversions. Um, but there will be a little bit of coding inside um, the uh, UI interface, and, and we'll, we'll show you when sending objects from Rhino how to make small changes to this solution. Um, inside the connector uh, solution, you'll also have a reference to the converter project. Here we have one converter for both Rhino and Grasshopper. And this is where all of the object conversions live. So getting your Rhino objects into Speckle objects um, that and, and back will happen in your converter projects. And it's structured in the same way with a shared project and versioned projects. So finally, with, uh, 
the converter is what handles the translation between your software, your CAD software application object and your speckle object. And um, the base objects the, and the objects kit that we saw earlier in the presentation all live inside um, core, which is where base is defined, and uh, our objects uh, solution as well. So here within objects, you can see the different categories um, from earlier. We're mostly going to be working in our geometry category and looking at curves specifically. So before we get started uh, with coding, let's look at why you would want to design your own speckle object or for instance, uh, what you can get out of uh, hacking one of our connectors. Let's open up Rhino. I've set up a very simple file for this webinar. So say you're designing a building and you have some facade design surface that you're using to generate uh, additional geometry that you want to use as reference points. So oftentimes like you can manipulate this design surface uh, on a facade, for instance, and uh, create a few intersection curves and then pull those curves into Grasshopper and generate some window panels or glazing from these curves. Uh, one of the, uh, if you try to send these pieces of geometry as is, actually, let's rebuild this solution. Forgot to do that. All right, let's start that again. So if you use the speckle rhino connector as it is installed through manager and you try to send your geometry to speckle let's create a new stream and let's send these objects I did not clean my objects library. Let's just check. Can be a little annoying swapping between dev and environments. So as mentioned before, objects kit is part of the C Sharp SDK builds a DLL that is stored locally. You can find speckle kits and sometimes if you make changes to that, you'll have to delete the library and rebuild. this one more time at the webinar stream send our objects and if we inspect the objects that we just sent from Rhino we'll see our Rhino layers here in our front end web and in the layers, you can see I've already organized the curves into um, the facade curves layer and the surfaces, the surf, the design surface in the surface layer. However, these curves and that surface uh, 
don't have any relation to each other. So while you can see the geometry in our viewer, you don't know that the curve that you're sending is in any way related to or generated from this design surface. And while you can be good about your stream organization and say, for instance, send your surface in one branch and send your uh, curves in another branch and then pull that into, for instance, Grasshopper if you want to make modifications, um, you can do that. But if you know that you're going to have a very consistent workflow in the project phase you're in and you know that whenever your uh, designers are changing this facade surface and generating new curves that you always want to reference your design surface on your curves you can actually create uh, you can actually uh, create your own custom curve class that includes a reference to the design surface and that way when you convert it when you retrieve it back in a different connector like your grasshopper connector you can uh, immediately access the reference surface that the curves are generated from. So in this instance, it's uh, it's a fairly easy way to start thinking about how once your workflows are more solidified in your project delivery phase, how you can start um, designing your own applications and custom speckle objects to encapsulate that workflow and simplify uh, the steps that you would need to uh, do otherwise. So let's figure out how to send this curve, which you can see has a few predefined um, properties that we're using to define uh, NURBS curves in Speckle. But uh, instead of just sending the base curve, we also now want to create a new property that basically attaches the design surface to, to this curve. Uh, so let's go and look at how we can do that. Um, one more note before we before we start on that. Uh, it helps to, to have a clear workflow in mind already before you start designing your custom objects. So for this for this workshop uh, segment, what I've done is kept conceptually uh, kept this very simple. There is a facade layer that contains this design surface as well as a curves layer that um, stores the curves. I'll set these curves actually for now all in default. And then um, I have a hidden layer um, of planes that is uh, being used to intersect with the design surface to generate these curves. So if we think about the workflow that we want to, the way in which we want to hack the Rhino connector, if you know that you want to organize your file so that your design surface will be in this uh, facade surface layer and any curves that you put in your facade curves layer will be sent as facade curves instead of regular curves, um, then you can, which is arguably sometimes not the best practice, but you can hard code this information into um, the, the Rhino connector that we'll be working with. So let's look into how to do that. Uh, let's open up, so again, a review of the repo. Um, this connect, uh, Rhino connector project has a reference to our objects project. And inside, we'll look in the geometry folder, which contains the class definition for our speckle curve. And this is a little bit complicated. It's how uh, NURBS curves are defined. Um, within a lot of CAD softwares. Um, we won't worry too much about these properties in particular. What we're going to do is actually create our own class that inherits from this curve class. So if we type public class, We'll call it a facade curve and use the colon to inherit from this curve class. 
And then within our class, we're going to keep our custom uh, class really simple. So now, since this facade curve inherits from this curve class, it will have, it'll inherit all of these uh, properties and and methods as well. And in addition to that, we want to introduce uh, one new pro property. We're going to attach our design surface, which uh, in Rhino will be a, a BREP. So we have our BREP class, uh, uh, speckle class defined already, but we want to attach it as a new property to our facade curve class. And we'll call this property design surface. And we didn't really talk about getters and setters, uh, but this is how you can retrieve the value of this property within this class and how you can also change the value, um, retrieving through the getter and changing through the setter. And then on top of this, we just want to create a really basic empty constructor for our class. And that's, that's about it. So now that we have our custom class, um, we need to figure out how we can uh, hack the Rhino connector itself to pass all objects in that facade curve layer as facade curves instead of regular curves. So let's look at the converter where that is happening. So inside the converter, we have uh, separate files that contain conversions for the different types of objects that we've seen in our objects kit. Uh, here we're going to first look at the main converter file and this file is kind of like a control file for setting what objects are supported within your um, connector and it contains a lot of conversions to uh, and from speckle. So all of our conversions to speckle will be called uh, whatever object it is to speckle. And then whatever conversions we are um, designing back to our CAD software are um, like object to native conversions. Let's find one. So here. Uh, so what we're going to do in our converter class, which is just uh, another huge uh, class, um, we're going because we want to set the layer that we are retrieving our um, facade curves from. We can do that with uh, by adding a new property to this to this class that can be accessed um, through our actual conversion methods. So for instance, underneath these properties, I can just add here. Uh, and this double slash is uh, just a comment. So this any text that follows a double slash, um, is, it won't count as code uh, when compiled. So here we want to add a new property to store uh, our facade layer. And here we're going to, this is working with the Rhino Common uh, API. So here you can see um, this tip. Uh, we are creating a property of type layer in uh, our Rhino doc space. And um, we can call that property facade layer in all caps. And then within this property, we're going to create a getter. So since we want to hard code that layer name in, we can do it directly in this uh, property getter. Um, we would want to return a value um, here uh, we're going to try to retrieve that layer, and this is another method that's already been defined. We can look at the arguments here in the tooltips. It's expecting a few um, arguments. It's expecting uh, the Rhino document, the path to that layer, and it'll return the layer index if, um, if it can retrieve the, the layer 
if it exists. So we're going to pass in our doc argument, which is another property set in this class. We are going to hard code in um, the layer path. So we are calling that facade uh, surface, or facade curves is where we're going to pass in our curves. And in Rhino, you use a double colon notation for sublayers. So we'll call it that. And then just uh, storing the uh, index of that. But we are returning this layer itself. So here with the tooltip, you can see that the this meth get layer method returns a layer object. And the setter, we don't really need to worry about. So now we have this um, facade layer property that we can access within, within this class. And then in this conversion, so we can see when we're converting our objects to speckle, uh, the logic here is a little bit more complicated, but you have Rhino objects in the document, and the Rhino objects will contain information about what layer it's on, for instance, um, and as well as the geometry. And then within each ge like uh, after retrieving the geometry of your document objects, we run quite a few different methods to convert them to uh, to speckle. So here, first we want to test, before we even convert the, the geometry, we want to test what layer the, uh, your Rhino object is on. And since we've already stored that layer in a property right now, what we can do here is first set a Boolean This is a facade curve is facade curve. We'll just set that by default as false. And then within this this loop, we're looking at um, this Rhino object called RO. So here, what we can do is test whether or not whether or not this object is in our facade layer and here you can retrieve uh, let's declare a new variable called object layer and then we will get the the layer of this current ro object so ro uh, attributes uh, layer index. So this is instead of the layer name, it retrieves the index. And then what we can do is compare that to the layer object that we have stored in our property or facade layer property. So now if we write our um, logical statement, so if the object layer, and uh, this actually should be called object layer index to be more accurate. If that index, and this double equals test for equality, um, we can call our property, which we named facade layer up above, and retrieve the index um, uh, index of that layer. So here we're, we're asking if our object layer index is the same as our facade layer index, then what we want to do is set our um, uh, object, our base object that we are creating here, we want to set that to a new method that we will create called facade curve to speckle. And then we're going to pass that method, which we haven't created yet, um, our, our uh, geometry. So our dot geometry. And once we set that, we want to set this Boolean. So we did, if we did find in fact that it is a facade curve, you want to set that value to true. 
and if not, we'll just continue with the rest of our logic here. So this is a very hacky implementation. And now since we have this Boolean, if we've already converted this um, curve object, then we can skip the logic here as well. So we'll just have another statement here. If is facade object. So this is saying if is not a facade object, then continue with, with all of this existing um, logic. So we'll just dump that there. And now it's hooked up in our main conversion routine. So now if we go back to this, it's giving us an error because this uh, facade curve to speckle method doesn't exist yet. And we're going to create this in our converter Rhino geometry class. Um, so here we have our nerves to speckle uh, method that's already creating a speckle curve from our nerves curve. We can just dump our new convert our new method here. Um, add facade curve conversion method here. And let's see if we can do this quickly. We'll add, uh, we want to return a facade curve now from this method. And we called it facade curve to speckle. And we're going to take in a nerves curve just like just like the regular curve conversion method. And here what we can do is actually since we have all the logic for converting it to a nerves uh, to a regular curve and we're inheriting from the regular curve, we can actually take advantage of this and recycle this logic here. So we can run this method. Um, we can create a new nerves vari uh, variable and um, run that nerves to speckle method with uh, our input curve as an argument. So this method will now return um, our speckle curve. And then this is where it gets a little bit messy. We're going to create a new facade curve. So this is our empty constructor. And then we're just going to copy all of the properties from our nerves curve to our facade curve object because it inherits from uh, that class. So we can actually, let's simplify the name a little bit so it's a little bit faster. And here, when you use the dot notation, you can look at all of the properties that were defined in that class. We're just going to set um, a few. And this will set it to the same um, values as our converted curve class. And this is a little tedious and not the best way to do it, but since we're just hacking. We will copy over all of these properties. Um, what are we missing? That's I think that is everything. Oh, wait, wait. And then on top of all of these uh, properties that were inherited from the curve class, we are now going to, we now need to set our design surface BREP property. And this design surface property, how are we going to retrieve that? So we can retrieve that by going 
uh, back to our converter, um, uh, to our connector actually, where we're processing all of our objects. And in the same way that we set the facade curve uh, the facade layer property in our converter, we can set a design surface property in our connector that we can use to, to retrieve um, for this conversion class. So if we go back, actually, uh, we will set this in the, yeah, uh, let's, ooh, we're running a bit late, 5.55. Let's actually, um, so all of this logic I've uh, already <laughs> uh, finished in another branch of Speckle Sharp. Since we're running a little bit late on time, I'm just going to pull that um, branch instead and show you the results from there. We're, we were almost there. We just uh, needed to set one last property. But um, let's get to the good stuff and to see how our custom classes work let's go in test so i'm gonna restore the only um change that we didn't get to was in the converter adding this design surface uh design surface property um, which again hard codes the facade uh, surface layer um, path and retrieves the the brep object in that layer class to to set as our design surface so that was basically the the last the missing piece, um, and let me reload this. So here it's the same as before, and adding this one last property to our facade curve conversion um, and converting that beer up to to speckle this design surface um, property that's in our converter class. Uh, defined here. So let's rebuild this, which unfortunately means we need to close down Rhino. Uh, let's also, before we rebuild, do this first. So deleting our objects kit because we've now changed our objects class. So we're going to rebuild. And I've been removing the bin and object folder from our uh, Rhino 6 connector just because we're, we're going to be working um, in Rhino 7. So now that we've rebuilt, um, hopefully everything uh, will go as planned. We can reopen our Rhino file. All right, where were we? Um, just before the good part. Uh, all right, let's, we've rebuilt our project. We've made our facade curves, uh, facade curve class. And now we want to send these curves again, but this time we're gonna make sure they are in this curves layer. And we'll send these curves again, and they should all have this facade uh, surface attached because the surface is in this facade uh, surface layer. So let's um, just select our curves, set that selection, and send it to our webinar stream. So now if we look at our new commit, we can see our surface and our curves. So here we have just the facade curves layer. And now if we look at the type, instead of um, geometry.curve, it's geometry.facade curve, that new class that we created. And it has all the same properties as our original curve, plus the design surface uh, beer up. Um, and the final note, uh, if you remember, we were talking about detaching properties before. If we check our curve, all of our facade curves, they all come from the same uh, design surface BREP. However, if we look at um, the design surface BREPs across these curves, 
uh, where was our first one? They are, it is stored uh, multiple times. So here we can improve performance a little bit by detaching this property, marking it as detachable uh, in our class definition. And that way um, uh, we won't be sending the same, the same beer up four different times. But yeah, that is the gist of it. So now if we receive this facade curve object in, for instance, Grasshopper, you can easily uh, retrieve that design surface from um, uh, that was used to ref as a reference for the curve uh, directly within the object itself. And yeah, that is that is everything. Um, let's just wrap up really quickly. There's some resources for getting started, as uh, many of you have seen before. Our speckle.systems website, um, speckle.guide for uh, all of our documentation, and speckle.community for our discourse forum. And yes, we'll see if there's any Q&A. Let me swap back to my Windows screen. Oof. Nope. Well, it looks like we are all done. Hope you guys enjoyed and uh, looking forward to people getting their feet wet with contributions. All right. Bye, everybody.